Äh, ja, guten Abend. Es freut mich, dass einige Menschen sich für die estnische Filmkunst interessieren und auch noch so spät am Abend dabei sind. Äh, ich hoffe, dass Sie den Film genossen haben, äh, denn ich finde, dass der Film Südamering von der Regisseurin Margit Lillak äh, ein sehr besonderer, sehr dramatischer Film ist. Und dieser Film gibt viel Stoff zum Nachdenken und ich denke, das ist schon ein wirklich ein sehr besonderer Film und ja, das zeigt, dass das Zusammenleben so mit fremden Menschen kann rosig anfangen, aber eigentlich ist das Leben nicht so rosig, wie man sich denkt, am Anfang denken soll, kann. Äh, es freut mich sehr, dass Margit Lillak äh, bereit ist, auch die Fragen zu beantworten und kurz äh, auch über Margit Lillak. Sie ist in Estland geboren. Und sie hat an der Universität der Künste in Estland und auch in England studiert. Sie hat bereits mehrere kurze Dokumentarfilme gedreht. Und ihr erster Dokumentarfilm in Spielfilmlänge, 40 plus drei Wochen, spricht über ihre Schwangerschaft und über die Geburt. Der Film ist in Estland ziemlich berühmt. Und der heutige Film äh, ist der zweite Dokumentarfilm in Spielfilmlänge und auch in Estland sehr berühmt und äh, hat auch äh, unterschiedliche Brei Preise gewonnen. Und ich will noch das tschechische Kulturzentrum und Christina Frankenberg für die tolle Zusammenarbeit danken. Äh, das Zentrum veranstaltet schon seit Jahren in Zusammenarbeit mit äh, UNIC Dokumentags und Estland war heute zum vierten Mal dabei. Ich hoffe, dass nächstes Mal treffen wir uns wieder im tschechischen Kulturzentrum in Berlin. Nicht so virtual. Aber ja, jetzt gebe, übergebe ich das Wort an Christina und ja, danke. Okay, vielen Dank, Meret. Meret Koppli ist meine Kollegin von der Estnischen Botschaft in Berlin, mit der ich immer wieder gerne zusammenarbeite bei der Präsentation von estnischen Dokumentarfilmen. And now I will switch into English and I would like to say hello to the director of the documentary, to Margaret Lillag. Hello, Margaret. And hello, Christina. I would like to ask you first uh, about uh, the beginning of your work on the documentary. How did you get to know about the commune? Did you know someone of them? And uh, how did you get the idea to make a film about this topic? Uh, I found out about, um, I think, two months before they moved into the manor. And I found out only afterwards that I knew uh, one person previously from before. All the others I just uh, met on location, basically. So I heard about the idea that there is a group of people to form this very first intentionally um, intentionally formed community in Estonia. So I approached them and, uh, and we talked several times and they gave a mutual decision of their circle that they agree to go with the documentary thinking and having all of us the best intentions and uh, the possibility to show the rest of Estonia and the rest of the world that they this venture will succeed and they will be a model for the rest of us. So we all had our best intentions in mind so nobody, nobody knew how quickly things would turn into a sort of a tragedy mm -hmm. yeah because i wanted to ask you if it was hard to convince them but in the beginning i guess or like you said it, it wasn't so hard at all because you all thought that that would be a very good experience and uh, everything would be fine and so it was not so hard to convince them i guess well as it is a, as it was a group of about uh, 15 people then there were different opinions and they used this sociocratic uh, method of uh, agreement so everybody more or less had to say yes to the project but some people I guess were more reluctant to open their personal characters and it took some time 
to for me to dive into this uh, communal vessel but over time they i well, i didn't know in the beginning who was going to be the protagonist so i was following several people and several possible dramatic lines and themes and topics but uh, yes it took some time to persuade and open up the the protagonist, Lena, who ended up being the protagonist of the film, I think she was the most reluctant, actually, toward the whole documentary idea. <laughs> and in the end, she she ended up ironically, or, or I don't know, tragically, ironically, to be the one to open up her own very dark wounds and uh, soul to the audience for being the most reluctant one. <laughs> to take part of this documentary but we we became really close and we are still very good friends and uh, we work on our next project together with all of them or with lena no with lena and uh, how did you organize your work uh, how often have you been with them or did they call you to come or did you spend a longer time for longer intervals with them and how long uh, did the work last? Well, altogether, I was shooting for about uh, four and a half years. And at the same time, we were also editing. I stayed usually, the crew was very small. It was most of the times myself alone. Sometimes I had a sound recordist. Sometimes I had a separate director of photography, but most of the times and most of the intimate scenes I've been there on my own and I always went for at least uh, three four days in a row in order to it wasn't like going to a normal shooting as just drive in there put the camera on the tripod and start recording because it always took several like half a day to even figure out what was going on and what had changed but I guess for me really helpful was that they trusted me to be in the, their mailing list so a lot of drama was conveyed also in the mailing list and a lot, a lot of events were agreed upon. So I had uh, like information beforehand. So, but pretty often I was also going there quite spontaneously on the very last minute that somebody, I called someone and found out now oh, this is happening or someone invited me for a special occasion. But many of the most important things just happened because I was there long enough and uh, at, 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 in the beginning and in the end I spent I, I went quite often like every weekend or I don't know two times two periods in one month but then in the middle when the conflict was kind of dragging along then I made some quite long pauses because I was myself getting in a way dragged out of energy <laughs> by this prolonged conflict so and nothing was changing it was just taking on new shapes so i knew that for for my film i didn't need all the new shapes of the drama so i basically skipped some months on the third year i think i skipped quite a few months and um, did you feel sometimes something like to, like a moral dilemma whether to film it or not because there, uh, I rem remember some scenes with Lena, and uh, yeah, I was wondering if I would be on your place. I wouldn't be so sure if uh, to stop the camera or to to shoot at everything. Well, usually, I before more sensitive uh, moments or scenes, if there was opportunity or if I. I saw them coming, then I asked a separate agreement from the people involved. But they were kind of uh, gave me the permission to, and I told them from the beginning that my agenda in a way is to always cross my own personal boundaries and also try to push the boundaries of the protagonists and the people that I film. And then I think it's it's not ethically unfair if I do it with love and empathy toward the people in front of the camera. So quite often I found myself in tears as well while filming. So it was like 
I was emotionally so involved that I never thought that uh, there were some moments, but I think in documentary it's uh, it's not like I'm I'm not after some kind of sensation like uh, oh these are like some really heavy deep emotions but it's like for me always uh, the reality that is like uh, more real than reality and they were also practicing this uh, radical uh, radical honesty practices so this was kind of part of the their whole concept and ideo ideology of how they perceived the social interactions is in a radical honesty mindset so this in a way was part of it and in alignment with their agenda thank you i realize that i forgot to mention that also uh, you can ask your questions if you have some but uh, please do not ask them but uh, write them in the chat and uh, if i see it right Philip, there are uh, some questions. Um, could you please read them to us? Uh, yeah, I would like to introduce to you also my colleague Philip, Dam, right from the Czech Center, who will be the manager of the chat today. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so there's a question from uh, Rike, who is asking, was the sociocratic method helpful in conflict situations? Mm. Well, it's difficult to say it's it's a tricky tricky method in a way it's really time consuming and um, it takes time to really master this uh, sociocracy in a way but uh, it did lead to quite a bit of confusion when people got involved in the sociocratic process in the very last circle for example when in a way in a way in an absurdist way opposed to the whole sociocratic uh, ideology some somebody said like who should decide who should leave but this is like totally against the sociocratic rules but they for some ironic like uh, irony of the destiny for this meeting like the most crucial meeting they asked somebody to be in charge of it and moderate it who was not so familiar with sociocracy so it kind of went out of hand <laughs> so in, in principle, sociocracy should should help because you you, you should never it's not the, the voice of the majority like in democracy, but you should everybody's voice is equal and if you say no to a decision, then you also have to bring on the table a really <clears throat> good reason uh, on which you could say yes to this. So you always have to find a good reasoning around your no. Or, or a condition, like a, a weightful condition on which you could say yes to this decision. But it's tricky, so I, um, I'm not a specialist. I, I just saw that they were practicing in it and they were getting better and better, but they did make some mistakes and it didn't always help. But in principle, it should help, yes. And it's also practiced in bigger, like in big, comp uh, in big companies. <laughs> So as to involve the people, so it's not like a practice only for the eco communes. Corp big corporations use sociocracy as well. There is another question from uh, Jana, um, and I quote: uh, "My feeling from the movie was that in the end the whole idea got kind of consumed by the love triangle and emotions resulting from it." Did it reflect also uh, the feeling of the everyday life in the commune or was it rather attractive from the movie perspective? Well, I think this is a major, <laughs> in a way, a major prejudice that I face when I get uh, feedback or about the film as if it was my choice as a filmmaker to focus on the drama. But my answer and my experience from these five years is that you cannot really pursue naively just the ecological sustainability without having in focus, first of all, the social sustainability. So if the relationship in the group is not harmonious and it's behind this love triangle, there's always a power struggle. It's not just about love triangle. It's a power struggle between the two women. 
So it's never about just ecological sustainability. In order to, to cooperate, like in any level, in any group, in any organization, the basis for it is social sustainability. And this is what the film is about. And this is what they said themselves in the very beginning is that is going to be their focus. Because you cannot go and change the world if you don't focus on the social relationships first. And then when the group is glued together and in alignment, following clearly the same ideas and only then the ecological sustainability can be achieved. Um, there is a, connected to this, there is a question from myself. Uh, actually, do you have some ways how to open the people in front of the camera or where the main protagonist is generally very open? Um, or did you, did you work with them somehow? <laughs> you mean manipulate them or <laughs> <laughs> that's not what I meant but <laughs> no it takes uh, a lot of time you have to spend a lot of time with the people that you're making films about and it's always like in Id ideal version an exchange of energy in a way it's not like I'm always wanting to receive something from them but I was uh, myself really felt part of the process. I was feeling really empathetic to all these people and I spent a lot of time just listening to them and talking to them also outside of the recording and just spent a lot of time with them and became friends with them. And for example, Lena to reach this kind of, this level of uh, trust, it took two and a half years probably. So it's not like I have a method, it's just, <laughs> You have to be present and you have to also give something from you just love that you have to love the person that you are making the film out of even if you it doesn't mean that you're gonna idealize them or show them in a per picture perfect way but that they feel they can trust that you have no evil agenda you don't want to like use their emotions for sensation which is often that i am accused of in especially in estonia as if i was just after some sense and clicks and audience numbers but <laughs> I never really saw it so pragmatically and it's a bit uh, it hurts a bit but I guess it's like freedom of speech <clears throat> uh, there is another question from Rika uh, the power struggle between the two women was obvious from the first minutes was that your focus after the shooting was finished or was it really obvious right from the beginning It wasn't like uh, clear cut obvious, but it was there. Also, I saw it from the beginning. But as they had kind of decided and the idea was not to have one leader, but to have a, a group of leaders in a way. <laughs> and so it, 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 it seemed like maybe they're gonna, they can put this aside because they together were the ones who were the founders and the ideologists. So and the leaders and uh, they were the drive and the energy behind it so without them this wouldn't have happened because the others were just in a way passive followers of their ideas but as uh, some moderators from a German older community called say came in and said very perceptively that uh, a one beehive cannot have two queens so this is also true that it's very difficult to somehow share the power and some people just have a natural born authority in the genes and others don't so they both did and they were both very strong strong characters so um, question from Merit what is your next project uh, you mentioned in the, at the beginning well, actually, I have uh, two projects. Uh, we are now uh, <clears throat> in a development stage for a docu-TV series of six parts about uh, European uh, intentional legal communities. But this is more like, it's not like so much a human drama. It's more like a TV style informational uh, quest or like in a road movie kind of format. And then uh, my other feature length project is about uh, women's sexual liberation. 
slash middle age crisis slash menopause and things related to women in middle age. Um, question from Jana. Did you ever regret making the movie in a sense? You mentioned you got emotionally involved and as protagonists are your friends now. No. <laughs> Never. I think the process for me was uh, even more valuable than the result, of course. And it's like a part of, it's a huge part of my life, these five years, it's just a long time and a lot of dedication and a lot of research and a lot of insight into human psyche and myself and the patterns that lead us. And I wouldn't, why would I regret it? It's a big learning. Okay, well, thank you to our audience for all the questions. And I also have some two or, two or three more. I'm interested in the children uh, of the commune. I like them very much and I like their very open, direct manner. And uh, I was wondering if there is no compulsory education in Estonia, if the people, uh, if the children are not obeyed to go to school because in the movie in the first time was to be seen that they are doing something like school but without real school lessons. Yeah, in the beginning, the school looked a bit like they were just uh, testing and experimenting and a lot of energy was put into sort of inventing a bicycle in this alternative education. But quite soon, I think the second year, this uh, turned into more a normal kind of like just democratic school using the principles of Gaia education and like down to earth ecological insight. But uh, they were following and the education is uh, is mandatory <laughs> and it is controlled by the state that the children should go to school and get education and they had the officers from the educational ministry come in and check every once in a while and it did turn into a more traditional way of teaching and they were sitting behind tables so the scenes that i show there are just from the first two months i guess and uh, the children, now all of the children have gone to normal schools, normal schools. <laughs> so. yeah. And I was still in contact uh, with the children after they left, after they left the commune. And do you know if they are still in contact uh, between each other? And do you know how they look from today? Or how do they remember the time in the commune? Because I had the idea that in the beginning they didn't like it so very much, but after this relatively long time, they became friends and it was not so easy for them to split up. Yeah, I am in touch with uh, Rosie, Lina's daughter. We were just on a trip together to Gotland uh, this autumn and he, she has grown up. She's 15 now with the Lou here looking like a punker. <laughs> you wouldn't recognize her on the street if even if you knew her. And she has turned into a really mature and balanced and grounded teenager. And I think one of the wisest ones that I've met of her age. So I am in contact, in closer contact with Rosie. And I also, I, I've been there in only this uh, September I was visiting. So I, I know pretty well what the children look like and still keep in contact as much as I can. And how do they remember it? I think it varies. I think they, some of them have really good memories. Some of them have some troubles still because it suits some, it depends very much on the parents, how they could hold the space for the kids and how secure they could make like this base security thing. Like they did live in, in separate houses and in separate apartments starting the end of the first year or so but somehow this divided uh, responsibility between the grown-ups made it a bit uh, confusing and schizophrenic for the kids at some point so it's always like it's there is no yes 
right or wrong or yes or no answer. It's like some things were really good for some kids. They were more positive than negative side effects. And it's, it's very individual depending on what kind of background they came to the community with and how their parents help themselves in the community and could hold the space for the kids. But I'm, okay. I'm sure they, they, they all take along like a amazing life experience. And, uh, but for me, it's like really heartwarming to see that Rosie has turned into like, I guess she was shot. She was suffering the most emotionally in this very fragile age, but she has turned into a very brave and cool young woman. That's nice. And uh, I guess you presented the movie or the documentary also to all members of the commune. And can you tell us something about their reactions? Did they like the film or not? Or, yeah, what were their reactions? The reactions were, there were like 12 different reactions. <laughs> I mean, everybody had their own reaction and depending on where they were at, themselves at the moment and how they perceived did they perceive it as a piece of art or did they perceive it as an attack to their history or whatever <laughs> so, but uh, nobody really opposed to I didn't have to in general they were very collaborative and uh, very open and very supportive of me in general so Yeah. So they didn't see it together. There was no screening for them, yeah. but you sent them a link and everyone saw it for No, for, no. no. Yeah? We had separate screenings in our studios, small uh, cinema, I don't know, three or four times. Some people came to watch it three times before the premiere. Some people just saw it once and uh, they all came to the premiere in Tallinn. It was premiered a year ago at Dockpoint Tallinn. It was the opening film. So all of them were there in front of a big audience. <laughs> so it was very stressful for them, I guess, to be present at the screening. And Lena came with me to Prague uh, this uh, March to the One World that we did some screenings together at the One World Festival and she was part of the Q&A. So I was really happy that she could join and also voice out her, her story or ideas about the communal living and ecology and <laughs> stuff like that. And uh, does the commune still exist when also in a smaller form? Yeah. Or did they get new members after uh, presenting the film in cinemas? Well, the thing is that the film in cinemas received like about 8,000 viewers, plus we did get some thousands on the VOD, but just now it was in on the national broadcasting uh, Estonian television station and it got huge audiences. So it's like in a way coming back to life a year later after the official release because everybody watched it on the Estonian television and so I'm not sure about what kind of response they will get uh, now it's I think it's more as the audience is wider the reception is from one wall to the other but uh, yes they are still there uh, initially it's um, three kind of three families stayed uh, one um, Pava and Dava is a family with a kid and then Selva with a two, a single mother with a two kid, kids and then Janika who was not in the film with her two kids. So in a way proportionally there were more kids than grown-ups who stayed there. So it's a bit of a, bit of a not maybe so balanced at the moment. But then also Lina is going back there quite often together with her new boyfriend from uh, France. And they are trying to revive the uh, community and uh, they are actually inviting new members more uh, actively this spring so we'll see but it needs some some new energy of course the people who stay there are not the kind of uh, energetic leaders who would pull in huge crowds and in a way before when people left then always other people came instead of them and 
place their roles. But at that point in 2019, when I finished the film, it was like half of the, or even more than half of the people had left. So in a way, the scales went out of balance and nobody came to replace them because too many people left and they were the founders and the leaders and they put the main energy in there. So in a way, it's been in a, in a kind of a standstill hibernation for two years and now hopefully it will start to spring out some new sprouts because there is a lot of interest and of course people look at the film and see that it's not so peachy but I think it's important to start these kinds of ventures without uh, hiding in behind these pink uh, sunglasses and uh, illusions. I mean, you have to be quite disillusioned to embark on this thing because many people think that, oh, this is just this group of people who, who didn't manage and I'm just going to be perfect in it. But actually, it's it's far from the truth. We're just not faced with this shadow side of us in a normal environment when we can go to our apartment and close the door every evening and just uh, be at peace. <laughs> but in a community, you have to face the uh, tens of reflections every day and it works kind of an accel accelerator bringing out all your traumas and uh, and uh, patterns from your past so you have to really face the shadow side of yourself very ruthlessly hmm. okay i think there are no more questions from the audience I also have no more questions, so I would like to thank you very much, Margaret, for the very interesting interview. Thank and, you. Uh, could you imagine to do another movie about that commune, maybe in two or three years, or did you end with this topic forever? <laughs> never say never, say never. but uh, for the moment I ended it, yes. Okay, so I wish you all the best for your thank new you. projects you mentioned. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you very much also to Philip and to Merit. And yeah, and I hope we can invite you sometime to a real Dokumentag to the gallery of the Czech Center. Thank okay, you. then Good bye. Luck. Bye.